All right, yeah, we have a lot to no get through today. Uh, I think we have more of us than we have of you guys. All right, Cody, are you good then? Yep. We're Finish setting up? Yep. Okay. All right, I'm Lydia. Again, you guys saw that. Oh, I think memories. Um, all right. Yeah, I wanted you to hear the beginning part because I'm going to talk. Um, I'm, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to open up the meeting again. And then, um, hey, James. Good to see you. <laughs> um, James is going to talk a little bit about why a vigilant. Then Kyle is going to dive into the access. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not on access control. <laughs> a vigilant control center. So last week we did ACM, access control manager. This week is ACC, a vigilant control center. So try to keep our acronyms straight. ACM versus ACC. But it all works really well together. So um, after that, you, this, so let me introduce first. Um, well, I'll finish the agenda. So Jim is going to talk a little bit about the halo sensor and some system design stuff. And Cody's going to bring it all together with how this uh, different solutions can integrate. And then Kyle will wrap it up. So with me, I have, again, so there's a couple of new faces. So I'm Lydia, sales representative for Radio Resource. We have our Vigilant integrator, Rob Morrison. Back in the back is Fred, who's everything access control, um, the original sales manager for our Vigilant access control. And then we have Jim McCutcheon. He is the, um, the Vigilant um, sales engineer, sorry, I'm trying to, James Kerrigan is the Vigilant account manager. And then we have Kyle Weiberg, who is the channel sales executive for Vigilant, and Cody O'Neill, who's the channel sales executive for Motorola Solutions. So, whew, all right, I'll go ahead and get going. You <laughs> Yeah, I know, I'm like, the Vigilant Motorola. Okay. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and go. So I'm going to go over this really quickly because you guys might think like, huh, I feel like I've been here before, but memory wasn't here. So for her sake alone, and a nice little refresher, um, a little bit about who we are, Radio Resource, and why I know that Radio Resource will be a great partner with World RE4 for these projects with the growing district. For one, we've been around a long time. So we were established in 1989. We are the largest Motorola dealer in Colorado and the surrounding states. Um, we are highly experienced with the Motorola Solutions suite of products um, that we've implemented in so many school districts. We are locally owned and operated, so all of our staff is local, including everybody in this room today that's also here to support you. We're all local, so nobody's flying in from out of state. I mean, not that that couldn't happen, but all of Radio Resource is extremely local, and I'm here in Windsor, so I especially cover this territory of um, we have a lot of high profile clientele where the solutions have to be on point, like the NFL that we work with, the Denver Broncos, the Colorado Rockies, lots of public safety and government agencies. And then on the next slide, so I noticed a couple white spots that didn't come through, um, but this shows some of the school districts that we're in, a lot of big school districts, Boulder Valley, Douglas County, Johnstown, Millican, Jeffco, Littleton, Mapleton, it didn't come through, but I won't um, go. I won't say every one. And plus, we're in a lot more um, individual schools and charter schools and private schools. But we work with a lot of schools in the educational sector doing these um, safe school solutions with Motorola. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Can you speak really quickly to schools you're in with? specifically the Vigilant solution? Yeah, um, District 6 uh, just put in the door access. Also, um, well, I, could, yeah, I can tell you, <laughs> yeah. uh, BBSD has over 2,000 cameras, over 2,000 doors with uh, Vigilant using radio resource. They have the halo units. Um, Jeffco Schools, 179 buildings, uh, Elizabeth School District, uh, four buildings, five buildings, but they uh, just installed ACC last year with the AI and VR, and um, they're also using radio resource as well. And also Canyon uh, City. Yep, Canyon City Schools, Adams 12, Adams 14, uh, so all, all vigilant D6, vigilant. all vigilant customers. Okay, on the right. camera side specifically. Yep. Thank you. All right, next one, thanks. 
Um, so again, why the Motorola solution, especially for Weld RE4, like I talked about last week, you guys are already using the Motorola radios. And so the way it works with Motorola that's really nice is you're not necessarily podpodging a bunch of different, um, you know, uh, manufacturers bringing in all these things and trying to fit them together and force them to work together. With Motorola, they have what is called an ecosystem of solutions that all are designed to work together. And so it's really nice because it's scalable. You can have one component and bring in another and they all, it just kind of expands the capabilities of the technology. Um, so last week we talked about the access control. You already have the Moto Turbo radios. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the video security and the video analytics. There's other things though like um, ally incident management or dispatch solutions if you wanted a central dispatch type of solution and all of these things like I said are designed to work together and um, later on Cody is going to show us with orchestrate that free web based platform how it can um, actually go to go ahead and go to this slide with orchestrate you can automate your workflows and so it's pretty cool you know kind of a if this then this happens scenario. If this happens, then I want this to happen, you know, to this radio. So again, the radio is over here. The access control manager is here. The vigilant control center is up here. Um, and then we're going to kind of bring the pieces together, showing you how that could look with orchestrate in an actual kind of live demo. So next one. Um, again, with a vigilant. Why a Michelin? It's a North American company. It's compatible with everything that you already have. Now, you can replace everything if you want, or we can integrate it with whatever, whatever you have. So you have the option. You know, um, it can work both ways. The, there's no mandatory recurring costs, and I think James is going to kind of get into that a little bit more. Um, the unification, complete unification between the access control and the video surveillance. Um, Again, it's not two different manufacturers that you're trying to get them to work together. These are designed to work in unison together. Um, there's many, many integrations and the free training, and again, the multiple lines of support with ev every one of us being local here to support you, along with you know more support, technical type of support from the Vigilant directly. So with that, it's not my last one. I'm gonna turn it back to you guys just since we have a few new faces, if you don't mind introducing yourselves again. And I'm just gonna ask the same question because I thought it was really valuable to hear from you. What you like about your current video surveillance system, what you don't like, what you wanna see different in the next one that you go with. So do you wanna start us off? Sure, yeah. Now Jeff, I'm looking telecommunications technician, but also do the programming for all the door access and, and cameras. Um, I think, you know, I said it last week, I think what I like the most is that I've, we've kind of aged with the system. You know, I've, I've went with it from the, from the beginning. You know, we were an analog system over at Winter High School when we started 12 years ago. And we've taken it up to where it is today, IP-based. Um, and so I have a lot of familiarity with how it works, how to program it, how to get in there. So that that's a comfort level for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. There, there's a lot that we've seen. So for me, I, I think what I what I don't like is maybe what I just don't know. You know, what what is the system not able to do that we have the capability to do? You know, as somebody that is is pretty pretty ingrained with this within the district, I want to make sure we have the best solution out there for what we're doing. And so just a better understanding for me. Um, Trevor Timmons, director of technology. Um, what I like about our current system is that we have it. Um, <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> which is a good start, it's a great start. But some of the other pieces around kind of compliance are a little bit iffy. We haven't had a good way to blur faces. Um, yet as soon as we use footage for discipline, it becomes a student record. And if anyone else is impacted in that, we can't share a student record with visible face of that student and so having an easy way to um, blur or obscure um, footage and and still be able to show other parents um, Colorado has some funky laws about how long you can hang on to footage um, especially um, 
watching it for no particular reason. And um, an incident comes to mind, it was a senior prank. It was funny, kids came in and I think this is old analog system, but you, we saw these huge, big round heads. They were like these masks, but like whole hat things come walking down the hallway and they go up to the cameras and a sticky note goes over each of the cameras. And then, so there's <laughs> nothing recorded for a couple of minutes. And then sticky notes come down. There's a trampoline in the middle of the high school and kids are doing <laughs> flips on it with these big heads again. Really funny, right? Um, <laughs> after, you know, I don't know if it's three months or a year or whatever, like we're not supposed to, if we're not using that specifically for a student record, we're not supposed to be watching that footage again. Um, and I am convinced that that's on three people's hard drives at least, right? Because it's, it's just a funny thing to look back at, but um, really making sure that we have some of those compliance pieces. Oh, we're going this way. Yeah. Are you looking for the video surveillance meeting? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Grab, a, so grab a chair. Any chair. You can grab a burrito, donuts. <laughs> um, John Ellingson. I'm the network administrator here for the school district. Um, what I like about our current system is like Jeff is able to centrally manage the system here within this building and still be able to access the door control and the video surveillance of the rest of the school district. Um, what I don't like is, since it is aged technology, the GUI system for the software that he has right now, there's no map integration, so we can't like open up a map of Windsor High School and say, this particular door, this particular camera, we have to go through a list to make sure that we've named each door camera specifically, so we're aware of exactly which door it is and not some other northwest in that building. All right, Stephen. We have a system that works. All it does is, no, I don't go on camera. <laughs> <laughs> All it does is, um, is video, right? And we've, we position them in a place and it just records. There's no other modern features that are with it and I'm excited to see and implement a system, a new system with more of those types of features, like uh, facial recognition type of stuff, uh, people tracking, uh, the, the uh, vape sensors, things yeah. like that. But that. That would be huge. So that, that's what I'm excited to see. All right. I think you're going to enjoy this then. <laughs> okay, Memory, do you have any? Uh... Yeah, I'm Memory. I'm the purchasing manager for the district, so I will facilitate um, the purchasing side of it. These guys are amazing at the technical side of it. And uh, um, prior to me taking this position, I worked in the tech department. And the only thing I know about the camera system is that I bought a lot of cameras <laughs> for it. Um, but they are great at, at uh, knowing everything, everything else about it. So um, I don't have to carry that burden so much. Um, and just so you know, because I'm facilitating the purchasing part of it, when we get into the nuts and bolts of technical, I might be in and out a little bit. It's not that I don't care what's going on. It's just the tech side is not my thing. And I have a couple of RFPs to get out today. So um, I'll be a little bit in and out today. And and so some of the new people here that were here last week, so you understand this project is to select a manufacturer that will be designed to, for our brand new schools that we're building. And then we'll take that design and also, or that the manufacturer and we'll also retrofit it to the rest of our schools. So we talk about our schools that are a little antiquated. They will also get refreshed as well. So it'll kind of split off into two separate projects at some point. Thanks. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you like and don't like about your current video surveillance? Yeah, I'm Nate. I'm a computer technician. I work with these guys, troubleshoot all the whole system pretty much. Um, I don't know too much about the system because I don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So I can't say for whether or not I like it or not. <laughs> oh, light, light. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Did I get everybody? Um, and one thing I just want to mention I'm holding, this is our ION radio. Uh, it's pretty cool. If anybody wants to take a look at it afterwards, I have all of our cameras at our company up on it as long as my hotspot's working. 
Um, so you can kind of see this is a radio. So it's a two-way radio with push to talk, but it also runs your Android apps. And so you can do things, pretty much anything a phone can do. You can make calls through an application. It's not exactly just like a phone, but it can be. So anyway, if anybody wants to look or hold it or look at our camera views, watch our employees in our office, um, you're welcome to do so afterwards. Will that work with our school safe system? Yeah, this is, this is just another one of the Motorola radios. So, at a lot of the school districts, some of the higher level admin like to carry one device to kind of do everything. So, this is definitely not a radio for every teacher, <laughs> but, you know, a few key people, you know, in the district that may want to kind of decrease the number of devices but still have their, their radio and the ability to do the cameras and all those alerts from, from their radio. That's all right, so James, I think yeah. you're up to talk okay. about why Mitchell Line. All right, sure. Thank you for having us, Thanks. guys. Appreciate it. Sorry. So mm -hmm. remind me again, uh, the video system you're on now, is it Genetech as well? Yes. I know Genetech access control, Genetech uh, video as well. Okay. Um, well, we did some of the introductions. My name, again, is Jim Kerrigan. I'm what they refer to internally as a channel account manager or a CAM. My main role is to look after our channel partners. We don't sell anything direct to end users. We so it's sort of a three-legged stool, I, I like to think about it, you know, you need each one of those legs working or it's going to fall over. So uh, the manufacturer, that's us, Motorola, uh, our partner. You want to stand on this side of, of the camera view. <laughs> You're setting off the ball. <laughs> Come on this way. Okay. Here you go. That's good. All right. Um, the, the manufacturer, our partner, uh, who we rely on heavily, they do a lot of training, they purchase the equipment, they do another 50% of it, you know, you got your equipment that has to be installed. So running wires, programming them, dialing in camera views, uh, getting that to talk to other systems, we rely on a partner for that. And then you guys as the end user that are going to be using the system day in and day out. So it's really that, that ease of use of, uh, we, you know, that we have and can share and the integration that we're going to talk about a lot. I know we're going to be a little bit focused today mainly on the camera systems. Uh, but obviously we have the access control system. These work seamlessly together. Uh, I typically refer to it as integration, but uh, we're told it's more of a unification, mainly because there's two-way communication. Traditionally, you're gonna have an access control system, a video system, and one would talk to the other, and not bi-directional. So uh, everything that we're talking about here today is gonna be bi-directional. We could share alerts from the camera systems that can go to the access control systems, and vice versa. So unified system and then expanding that even further out from the security platform to the radios. We'll talk a little bit about that and some of the other devices that uh, we're going to show you here today. So integration is key. Uh, Vigilon got its start back in 2004, and I was in the industry at the time. <laughs> it was analog cameras uh, throughout. Uh, IP was still being debated whether that was going to be the, the foundation, you know, and uh, <laughs> looking back at it now, it's sort of funny to, to see that those debates were even going on because now that's, that's the industry that rules, rules the day. Uh, but yeah, at that time, um, you know, IP was coming on the market. Uh, a Vigilant came out with uh, uh, a 12 megapixel camera. At, the, at that time, there was like one SIF and two SIF. We weren't even talking megapixels in, in video security at that time. So our real foundation was uh, video, uh, the quality of the video. Once we had that, uh, that becomes data, okay? These are pixels and we're able to assign metadata to that. We uh, shortly after that started to add video analytics, one of the first in the industries to do that and are still today the leader in that with over 800 patents in this technology. Um, video analytics are not 100%. Um, it is computer <coughs> learning and, uh, and making decisions and so they're, it's, they're continually to get better. But uh, a vigilance probably in the 90, 90 percentile of accuracy when it comes to of it, um, analytics, one of the leaders in the industry, and really sort of our foundation outside of uh, the, that quality of video. Um, sorry, back in 2014, Motorola bought uh, a Vigilon. I was on the integrator side, <laughs> and I thought, well, there goes another good camera company getting bought up by the big guys, right? And why would a radio company want video? Well, getting behind the curtain a little bit, so to speak, now I, I, figured, I figured it out. Motorola is a telecommunications company, has been for almost 100 years. That's their foundation. Video is a form of that, telecommunications. So if a picture's worth a thousand words, video's worth, 
you know, who knows, right? You can watch a video, you can get your, uh, your uh, facts right there and, and move forward and, and then communicate that. So bought in 2018, part of a 100 year old company and it's really a unique fit. Uh, one of the first things that they did was um, integrate the cameras with the radios. So with those analytics, an event comes in, camera picks it up, it can now push that alert to the, to the motor rail radios. One of the only manufacturers in the industry that's doing that today, right now. So, if you want to go to the next slide, I can sort of talk how we sort of fit with, again, within the Motorola uh, uh, ecosystem. They've really broken down a security situation into four, what we refer to as four pillars. Detect, analyze, communicate, and respond. All right, so Vigilon really fits on the front end of this workflow in the detect and the analyze, and then sort of in the gray area of communicate. So uh, we need the camera or a card reader or whatever it is to detect what's going on, right? Once we're able to detect that, we're, uh, we have software that is able to analyze that. That's our analytics. That's uh, the camera being able to say that that's a person or that's a vehicle within the scene, and then we can do things with that, send you alerts. That's on the front end to make it proactive. So as a car is moving out of a parking lot that's not supposed to move, somebody could be notified right away on the radio, or a text message, or an email, or we could set off lights, or whatever, you know, put a gate up or down. Whatever it is, once that's detected, we can relay that to something, all right? Then on the back end of that, we use that metadata to do fat, quicker searches, okay? So we find a person within a camera that's a suspect, and we wanna know where they went. I could simply click on that image, and say, show me where this person went or where this person came from. And Kyle's going to show a little bit about that in our appearance search. So it's both proactive and reactive where we're saving time, which is what matters when there's a security situation going down. Um, so that analyze piece, and then we can push those to the communication piece through, again, those radios, um, the dispatch software. I think some of Cody's going to bring that all together with the orchestrate and how we can distribute some of that, uh, that information to the right people. Um, and then there's other things, um, there's a product called Ray for emergency mass notification so that these alerts could then be pushed to that. So Motorola is really looking at that whole scope of what, is there, what happens from start to finish. And then on the back end there's software uh, for incident management, reporting. So some of the stuff you might not be interested in right now, but this is where the industry is going. This is what you probably want to take into consideration as you put in this foundation for the next whatever it's going to be, five or ten years, know that uh, it's, it goes much more beyond a camera and a recorder uh, that we tradi traditionally used to be with. And it was really more of, of a luxury, now it's a need, right? And then things like privacy are coming into uh, issues, uh, or having concerns around that. We've addressed some of that. Um, Cyber security is a huge thing now. Like, can you get into your network through a camera? You know? So all of these things on the back end are being uh, taken care of and understood. Keep in mind that Motorola's largest uh, vertical is government, and uh, has been for a long time on the radio side. Federal government, uh, local and state government, they have huge uh, cybersecurity needs, and have for a while, so they're very well prepared to address that. So, and then the response piece, we'll, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, so we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, so at Motorola, at, uh, at, at, at a Vigilon, we're a manufacturer, so we manufacture the cameras. We manufacture the software. This is enterprise level software. This is not just a you know um, a piece of software to have a camera view. Uh, and Kyle's going to show a little bit more of that. So starting off with the cameras, um, and um, again we got started with this Pro camera, still around. It is now can go up to 61 megapixels. Highly specialized camera. You're not going to use this everywhere, but if you have large parking lots, uh, stadiums means that you can take a large view with one camera and then be able to digitally zoom in to get the detail that you need. So uh, it really shows well in stadiums like the Rockies and the, and the um, what's the football team? The Broncos. We're done. I'm a hockey guy. Okay. Okay. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so Mile High Stadium, actually I'm a big sports guy, sorry I just had a brain. <laughs> So they, uh, we replaced one, uh, one of our pro cameras replaced 16 of those cameras uh, to give them the clarity and got more clarity and more evidence in that. So it's big uh, in those areas where we got to capture a very large area. Schools use us a lot in those parking lot scenes where we don't have to put cameras out necessarily out on poles. Lots of infrastructure with that. 
we could put it at the roof line of the school and see a whole parking lot, you know. Now, keep in mind there's obstructions that we have to take in, in, into consideration and stuff. But uh, highly specialized camera, and then down to just our, our mini dome camera for maybe just wanting to see who comes in and out, out of the IT closet. You know, small, pretty inexpensive, really good views, uh, high resolution. Uh, and then, then everything in between. So uh, we have multi-sensor cameras that have multiple lenses in it, but only use one license, one data drop. This helps to reduce cost. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, license plate cameras, intercom <coughs> cameras. Um, you know, I'd say 80% of the cameras you're probably going to be using are going to be our dome or bullet uh, cameras. We're going to probably satisfy most of your needs. But just know, we need to know the security objective, and we have a camera for it. All right. So it's of our opinion that the camera's there for a reason, to see, I don't know, who's coming in and out, who's going too fast. We need to have license plates. So there's a need. And we want to know what that is, and we're going to size that camera accordingly. So then on the back end, we should have on the next slide the infrastructure piece. So a big part of that is that camera's caption that has to be recorded or stored somewhere. All right. So we have a full line of uh, what we refer to as NVRs, network video recorders or appliances. This is where we're going to store your video. And again, depends on what your needs are of where we're going to go and make what suggestion we're going to make. So how many frames per second are you interested in? We can go as high as 30. Maybe 60 on some of our PTZs, okay? Uh, maybe you don't technically need that much. Uh, often we're seeing 7 to 10 is about the average, but maybe you need more, you know? So we're gonna, that's going to affect the storage uh, that you're going to need uh, based on that, the motion of the camera, um, how long it needs to be stored, 30, 60, 90 days. Maybe some cameras need to be stored for a year. You know, we have, we're in uh, uh, corrections facilities. There's new laws out now for... Um, uh, voting where they have to keep the, that ballot box for uh, 366 days or something like that. So whatever those needs are that you have, your policy procedures, we want to know those. We're going to size the NVR accordingly. Maybe we have them scattered out through different buildings. Maybe we have a central location. Uh, just really depends on your infrastructure and how you want to deploy that. All right. So that's the second piece. And the third piece, uh, and, and so on the NVRs, we have we have uh, our AI appliance. So when we talk about analytics, for us, if we're starting from scratch, we would recommend an analytic camera. So we process the analytics at the edge, at the camera, then sends that metadata to the NVR, and then we're able to manipulate that and give you alerts, alarms, searches, that type of thing. If you have existing cameras that you want to reuse, we have what we refer to as an AI NVR, and this adds analytic to non-analytic cameras. So you don't have to forklift the cameras that you put in two or three years ago. All right, we can add analytics to those cameras as well. Again, just need to know what your what your needs are, or how, what you want to try to accomplish here. We also have Linux-based machines and and Windows-based machines. So depending on what type of philosophy you have around that, uh, you know, Linux-based, you put that thing in, boom, you don't have to do all the Windows updates. When there is an update, it comes as a complete package, pushes everything to the cameras for the firmware, updates those all automatically. So really time-reducing. Uh, on that end. But then we do have the Windows-based machines uh, for some of the larger uh, platforms or, or solutions. So again, it just depends on where, what your needs are, what your preferences are, and we can mix and match these as well. So we're very flexible when it comes to that. Then I think on the next slide, we're, um, you know, the, the software is really what pulls this all together and is where you're going to spend 90, 95% of your time. All right. Once the camera's in, the recorder's in, and it's programmed to do what it's supposed to do, you're going to be within our software. Again, enterprise level, so very uh, scalable from one camera. CenturyLink is one of our end users. They have 18,000 cameras on their system across the world. So uh, it scales very easily. Um, one of the pieces of this that we talk about is our uh, Vigilant Cloud Services. Um, so we'll just say right off the bat that the um, people think of cloud and on video, they're thinking we're storing video in the cloud. On the Avigilon side, we don't do that. We refer to this as an on-prem system, but the Avigilon Cloud Services gives you access to that video and it helps you distribute rights to people that they could use their mobile device, a tablet, uh, a web browser. We do have a thick client that uh, we recommend for those uh, security personnel. But this, uh, the Avigilon Cloud Services allows us to give access to those people. Uh, even, even people outside of your organization, like a, a local police department, so if you have an incident at school, has to go to the local police, you can send them that link for that video and just that clip or however much 
you want to share or don't want to share with them. So this is where a lot of those privacy issues comes in. Who has the video? Who do we distribute it to? You know, we work with uh, Jeffco Public Schools, one of our larger school districts in Colorado, and they're looking, uh, they're beta testing this right now. It will do it. They're just very slow in implementing it. They have, uh, they're working with our Arvada PD uh, really to determine how this process is going to flow. I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, when it, what are those policies and procedures? That's really on the school and the, and the PD to figure that out. But we have the technology to support that once they decide how it's going to roll, right? So, um, so that's where Vigilant Cloud Services comes in. There's a couple other things like health reports, things that you can access that system remotely. A big piece when we talk about cloud is that cybersecurity. And so we are uh, SOC 2 uh, and ISO 2000, uh, 2000 <laughs> is the, and this is all about uh, cybersecurity. This is constantly being tested, uh, for, you know, uh, every six months or something like that. They're trying to hack it and see if there's any vulnerabilities or how we correct them. So this, this was a big deal. This took almost two years to get certified on the SOC 2. Uh, does, it allows you not to have to open up uh, uh, your firewall or certain ports. It has a secure handshake through Microsoft Azure. Once that security is, uh, is established, then you have a direct into that particular recorder for the video that you can manipulate. <coughs> this is going to become larger and larger for us. Cloud is sort of where things are going and where they're at. Uh, but with video, there's a lot of resources that it takes up. So I think larger systems, on-prem is still sort of solution. Um, but we do have cloud offerings through other products that Motorola has, uh, if you're interested, but I, I don't think that's applicable here. Um, so we go to the, the next slide, and then, of course, the Access Control Manager, we saw, I think you guys saw this last week. Um, again, open platform, completely integrates. We're able to uh, take that, that card read associated with the camera, where did this person go, follow them through those cameras, through the readers. Uh, I think we talked a lot about that last week with Fred. So, and then so you know why why a vigilant? Why uh, how why would it be useful for you? Why would you consider it? Uh, biggest thing we talk about is cost of ownership. What does it take after you bought this system to, to maintain? And so we really like to focus on that piece of it. Uh, back to the, the the hardware as well. So cameras like our multi sensor camera, our fisheye camera. How do we position these cameras where we could use less cameras, which means less infrastructure, less hardware, less labor, less licenses, to accomplish the same goal as maybe three or four cameras did in the past. So helping reduce those costs on hardware, which equals less software, equals less labor. Uh, a couple of other things we'd like to mention around the ownership of it. Uh, there are no uh, annual software agreements through us. Uh, you buy the license, you own it. The, you can run it forever. We started off with ACC4. I don't know why it wasn't one, but uh, we're still, ACC4 systems are still out there. They're still being supported. Uh, we're now on ACC7, soon to go to ACC8. Um, so you own that license, you have it. It doesn't cost you anything year to year to, to maintain it. We're going to continue to support it. Uh, tech support 24-7, uh, 365, both for our partners and for our end users. So you as an end user could also call tech support if you needed to. We highly recommend you work through your partner, but if it's Christmas Eve and you can't find Rob because he's out doing something with his family, you could call tech support for that particular camera that might have went down that you needed. You know. um, training. Training is a big, a big piece of uh, what we, uh, we want to emphasize. No cost for training. Training is free to both our partners and our end users. Uh, you can get certified. There's uh, modules online that can be taken by anybody. They just have to register. Uh, we highly recommend it for your power users on the system that they take at least three courses out of that, those modules. It's probably about a total of six hours total. Uh, if you want to go a little bit further, there's a technicians that maybe you guys are self-sufficient and you want to work on your own cameras. There's about 16 hours of, of uh, training that you would have to do to get certified. Again, free. A lot of our competition charges for that. And then when you call tech support, they're going to say, what's your certification number? And if you don't have one, they're not going to help you. So. None of that with a Vigilon. Anybody could call if it says a Vigilon on it, we're going to assist. All right. Big important piece of maintaining your system and those costs. Like we're not nickel and diamond after you put the system in. So these are things that you want to be aware of uh, with, with competitors. Um, patented technologies, 
uh, this effective bandwidth. That high definition camera, when we first came out with that, video on a, on a, on a system is a, is a data hog, right? How, do we, how are we moving this video? So shortly after that camera came out, we had to come out with some, some technology to reduce that bandwidth. We're able to do that by 50% uh, through really the detail that we want to send for the camera to make out your image. As you digitally zoom in, it's going to then send you more data. It's not just streaming all of uh, the data that you need to see uh, everything that that camera is going to produce. It's going to really just be for the human eye. So uh, we have several technologies around that. Again, the advanced a uh, video analytics and AI. Uh, Kyle's going to show a little bit of the focus of attention, which is really, for Motorola, we're on a philosophy. We don't want people watching video. It's useless time. Put the camera in, make it smart, tell it its objectives, and when something happens, it's going to notify you, then you can go to the system. So having somebody in a, in a sock with a, these, you know, it's impressive looking. It really is. I've, I've built a few of them in my ears. Uh, but they're very inefficient. They're, they really are. So the focus of attention allows us to um, put that camera at its need and then notify you, and it's going to have a really clean visual that a camera is either up and running but just by the color, and that there's motion, or that there's an alert or alarm, and then it's going to push it to the right people. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that. And then really the proactive to reactive. This is where analytics really has changed the industry. Um, it's been around a while. Uh, I think it's gaining more and more traction. But really that camera being able to tell you when something happens instantly and not waiting to the next day to figure out and then do that forensic piece. Okay, somebody broke into this car. Let's go back and find it and look at it. Um, you know, if something happens, those analytics are going to let you know right away so you can respond. But then on the reactive side, that's still a lot of work. Uh, like we were saying, uh, you're doing your investigations. We have tools that are going to take those searches down from six, eight hours a day, I'm told, to minutes. And we're going to show you that through some of, uh, some of those tools. So, and then the quality. You guys are used to Motorola. Um, you know, they're, they're known for their quality. Vigilant is as well. Uh, so we were we, we fit like a glove with with them there. Um, we're 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 constantly designing uh, the end-to-end -end solution. So the, the surveillance, the analytics, the artificial intelligence, the cloud, the access control. That's all in in house. We're doing that on our own, and and um, and constantly progressing progressing that for people. And we want to hear from our end users. So as a manufacturer, we're very interested from time to time, we'll actually have some of the product managers come into our territory and they're gonna to want to go to some sites and they wanna to listen to you and see what those needs are so we can implement them. Uh, we also have a education business development manager. She's here local as well. I think that's one of the things you'll notice with Motorola. You have a ton of resources whether you want them or not. <laughs> so uh, this whole group in this room that's local, we even have a few other people that are here to support. And there's another gal uh, that's specific to the education market. So we want to know. What's that? Todd Miller. Todd Miller, uh, A and E. So if there's anything when you're building the new schools, if you need uh, drawings for your uh, your consultant or spe specifications that need to be written, we have all of that uh, for you as well. So saving some time and energy there. Um, and then the open platform. So we're we're always going to be talking about our end-to-end -end solution. And I think that's going to be your best experience using a Vigilon, but we're also open. So you could use third-party cameras, uh, third-party equipment that we don't own or manufacture. Uh, we do that through ONVIF compliancy, um, which is an industry standard for the major manufacturers of the cameras uh, out there. It was developed by Bosch, Access, and Sony back in the early 2000s. Really didn't take hold until probably the last 10 years, and it's really the, the, the foundation that's going to say, my stuff's going to work with your stuff, your stuff's going to work with my stuff, and we can play together. So that's our native language within our, within our camera, so we don't have a third party that, uh, piece that we use. But I, I like to refer to it as if you're an Apple person or a PC person, you know, remember those old commercials? An Apple, my girlfriend's Apple, everything's Apple, I buy her a, a watch for Christmas, she's like, oh, can you hook it up for me? I'm like, yeah, no problem. What's your username and password? Put it in, boom, it's working. Same thing with the cameras, that's exactly how it works. If it's a Vigilon, it all works. Third party, I'm more of an Android guy. You know, sometimes I have to load a driver or look something up or Google or search something. It will work, I could get it to work, uh, but there's a little bit more labor that's involved there. You know? So really, it's, if it's end-to-end -end Vigilon, it's plug and play, it's, there's time efficiencies and, uh, and things that go along with that. So 
That's the main reason why a lot of uh, people choose a vigilant. I think a lot of these probably apply from what I read through the RFI to, to your situation here. Any, can I answer any questions around, around that? I'm just curious on that open, um, and you had shown some of your hardware, whether it's network attached storage or you know your servers. Can we run on our own equipment on virtual machines and stuff? Or if, if we're in a, a Vigilant solution, are we buying a Vigilant hardware? So the, the quick answer is yes, you can use your own hardware. Uh, the recommendation is no. <laughs> and when we get into some of the features like our appearance search, it's very taxing on the system. These NVRs are built for that. Uh, so we could talk through that a little bit. But Jim, we would say yes, but you're yeah. on your own. Yeah. At that point, <laughs> and that's and that's part of yeah. I mean, we, we have many customers that do virtual, but um, you have to like you said, just the, the we we design and we've we've vetted out and tested and tested and retested our GPUs that we use in there before the current search. You have to have a certain type of GPU to be able, able to run our analytics, some of that, uh, the storage requirements, um, and, and different things like that. Uh, the support obviously would would kind of not be as, as much as with their own equipment, but yes, I mean there there are environments where people do run virtual machines, and, and, and we'll work with them as much as we can to get that up. Um, part of what the nice thing about when our hardware and with the the, the Windows based machines is is those those Windows based machines show up to you with only the only ports that need to be open, only things that are running in the background, and all those different things just designed to run our software. Everything else is shut down and, and hardened, so that's part of our hardenability with our own hardware in the Windows machines. So, so, yeah. so you, you can do it. We don't recommend it, uh, especially when we get into a lot of these more advanced features and some of the integrations that go with it. We could, there could be some issues there. So it's really how much time do you want to spend with your department on, on figuring that out. The Vigilant will be able to take you so far. Sure. If you're using all of our stuff, we're going to guarantee that's going to work. Warranty of five years on the equipment. And uh, it's good, well, if it doesn't work, we're going to replace it. So, so you're going to weigh, weigh that. Uh, so help me understand, uh, just kind of follow up with what Trevor's saying there. So we're part, we have a server then in every every location, and then a central one. I mean, is, are they are they talking about really, that? It's really that's and, up to you. Okay, and, and the reason I'm asking is for sustainability. You know, we have we have a fiber cut, or we lose connectivity to a central location. Thanks. You know, I would assume right right now we have it set to where we have an archiver at all of our schools. Yeah. Um, set to where if we lose lose connection, we're we're okay. Yeah. Um, that we're still operating within that. So, what, what's the recommendation? Well, there, there's a couple there. Uh, again, you know, going back to the, I'm old school, so I like putting an NVR at every building <laughs> because of that. Because back in the day, yeah. the internet was just not that dependable. And then certain areas, it's still not really 100% up and running, you know. Um, we have several school districts that run it centrally, and they don't seem to have any problems with that. Uh, there are several ways I think we're gonna talk about addressing the questions on uh, recommendations for backing those up. We have failover options. Uh, the biggest thing I think is, most of our cameras will come with an, S an SD card slot in them. Put that SD card in there. You know, terabytes like 30 bucks nowadays. Uh, which you could probably keep video on a camera for about 30 days. Uh, once that, so if that camera loses connectivity at any point, it's going to store the video on the camera. Once it's reestablished uh, re back to the NVR, it's going to patch that. It's what we call OnVIF Profile G, and it's new within our H5 cameras. So it's not reading all the time, it's only reading when it loses connectivity. You could set it up either way. You could set it up to constantly write to that SD card, but most people put it in if it loses connectivity. It's going to stay on that card until it regains that connectivity, and then it's going to patch that video within ACC. So, again, we got options on however you want to, uh, however your infrastructure works. But uh, and the, even the centralized if, location is huge now. Right? Even if you have a server at each one of the locations, you have one point to manage that. Sure. You don't have to go to all the other right. facilities. Right, but we just want to make sure, again, just survivability. Right. You know, the, the, the amount of construction that goes on, you know, the Same. opportunity for fiber cut is, is great. Yeah, no. So we, oh, yeah. we, we, we deal with that, so we just want to make certain. And, and I, I could be putting the cart in front of the horse. There might be a solution that you're going yeah. to you know, visit about. Just curious how it looks. What's well, your guess? Even think? at NIST over in Boulder, where they have the atomic clock, they actually have two systems. So they're taking two streams from, the, you know, from each camera. One goes to one system to record, and then redundantly goes to another system to record. So it's really flexible and scalable. It's really the our infrastructure isn't going to dictate your infrastructure. Yeah, we got, we got some options there. So yeah, if so, if there's known connectivity issues, I highly recommend putting an NVR at, at that location on premise. 
They're not known until they happen. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the, the the very inexpensive backup plan is to put the SD card in a camera. I don't sure. Know yeah, I, but I, I agree with you also, and I think kind of the old school is where yeah, I would prefer to have a, an NVR or a. a, a Carver, whatever you call them, in, in each location, just for the simple fact. I mean, it's hard to go down the street where there isn't construction nowadays. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, always the biggest fear is, um, I mean, you're, there, there is fiber cuts, there is different things, connectivity issues. And every time you come out, out of a building and out into the street, now you're relying on the, the local SD, ISP provider and everything else. So, um, and uh, we, as we all know, video is very bandwidth intensive. So, um, that's the nice thing about being being local, but also having, and then Kyle will show you, just a centralized location to pull in as many servers and servers or so from as many different sites that you want to be able to manage yeah. at. So it's like you're sitting right there in the building with it, but you're not, so. Yeah, so just real quick going back to that NVR uh, and all of the different ones that we have, that's the reason why. So it could be as small as a four terabyte, maybe only have six or eight cameras in a school or, or a module building or whatever it is. We have an NVR for that. Or if you're centralizing that, we could go up to 1.2 petabytes uh, on your backup storage and your archiving. So we're flexible. We really want to work with you on, on sizing that correctly. Um, this is going to be the this is going to be the single most expensive component within your system is your NVR. Your root is, and it's the most <laughs> uh, most demanding piece. It's going to be the most important piece in, in, your, in your infrastructure. So what else do we want to talk about, Kyle? Do we? Uh, I think we're pretty good, Jim. Good there. Shows the and then, uh, so then I'm going to talk a little bit about the system design. A lot of times when we're sizing these cameras, we're going to talk about our pixels per foot, and that's really the clarity of the image that we that the camera is going to see. That doesn't look so great, but 20 pixels per foot will I'll be able to make out, uh, you know, a person in a, in a white white shirt and black pants, uh, and maybe that's all you need. This is what we refer to as situational awareness. Uh, I just need to see that that was a. A white pickup truck that went through the uh, through the parking lot. I don't need to have the license plate on it. If we need license plates, we can do that. We want to size that camera uh, camera's resolution between 75 and 100 pixels per foot. Facial recognition. I think somebody mentioned. You know, we want to be up in that higher pixel per foot as well. So again, what's the what are you trying to do with this camera? And then we have you know maybe only need a two megapixel camera to see who's coming in out of the front door. You want to see license plate? We might need to go to higher res resolution. So uh, we have a design tool that we put this all in uh, in the beginning. The design tool shows these pixels per foot and the clarity that we're going to get with the camera, the field of view. We're also on the back end determining the storage that it's going to require based on your requirements. Frames per second, uh, length of uh, storage, motion detection, this type of thing. So uh, we could do all of this math up front so there's no guesswork you know, after the fact. So we'll back it up. That's good. All right. Thanks. All right, guys. Any, any other questions around what we talked about? Good. Nice. Excellent. So I'm Kyle. Uh, I work with a lot of end users here from, in Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, people down the street, down the road, other side of the state in Durango. Uh, but certainly have a pretty good experience and understanding of what people do for different systems. I'm not opposed to questions, so as we go through the software tour, if you see something that kind of makes you, uh, you know, put your hand up, please go right ahead and ask. Uh, we're going to get started here, and we're going to log into ACC7. This is our Access Control Center, so ACC being the short. We're on the seventh version today. Uh, next week at ISC West, we're expecting big news. We're expecting when we're, we'll see ACC8 later this year, which is going to have some pretty cool features they can tell us about. But to get started, I'm going to log into the, the two sites that we have at our demo sites in Texas. One's at the training center, the other one's actually, actually at the factory where they make the cameras. So uh, I'm gonna just change the, uh, the username here to ACC Remote. And if you guys were so interested, we could actually provide this for you. You just download the client, you could go tool around and see what's checking out, uh, what, what's happening in Texas. But you can see I have two servers highlighted right now. I'm gonna log into both with that same uh, password and username. Did I type it in wrong? I probably did. Mm -hmm. Four C's. So I think one, one of the things we didn't mention in the, in the cost savings piece, all of our software is free. You can download it from our website at any time. Clients for workstations, the software itself, ECC. If you see that camera, you need at least one camera license to be able to access recorded video, that type of thing. So. And then as you're talking about launching eight, 
that's like a major version upgrade that would have a cost if we wanted to access that next layer? Yeah, yeah, good good question. So right now we're in ACC7. Those licenses, I'll just use a round number. You'll be on enterprise because the number of cameras that are involved. It's about $300 MSRP a channel. Once you want to go to eight, it's about 10% of that. It's about $30 a channel to upgrade. You don't have to go to eight. Uh, there's probably going to be some features in there that you want. We'll probably build that into uh, the cost when, when this becomes when we're bidding, uh, when the partner's bidding it. So we have what they call a software assurance license that we could put out on the front end to take care of budgets that you know of, or you can buy it later on on the back end, but it's about $30 versus the original 300. Okay. Cool, so this is out front in Allen, Texas. Uh, so I'm bringing that 16 megapixel pro camera, just like this camera here, over the internet through your guest Wi-Fi and we're viewing it here on our client. Uh, I'm gonna open this up here so we can kind of see what's going on. You can see the blue bounding boxes around those cars, right? So we're doing classified object detection. For video analytics, Jim mentioned we own over 800 patents in video analytics, and that means that our next generation analytics right now, are, uh, which are on our fifth generation, um, basically, we're a generation ahead of everybody else that's out there in the market. We're, our algorithms are so complete that you basically set this H5A camera out there, and it knows what it's looking at. It can classify objects right out of the box. So if it's a car, bus, bicycle, uh, truck, it's gonna be able to tell you it's a vehicle. If it's a, a person, we're gonna certainly tell you about it because where all the security events originate from, right? <laughs> it's people. Yeah. So that's exactly what we're looking for. We're trying to avoid giving you alerts on you know, deer or elk or cows. Uh, we're trying to bring you the best information so that you have the confidence to know that I got this alert, it means something, right? So when we look at those particular cameras, uh, there's a couple things that go on. We have an HDSM smart codec between the camera and the recorder that basically allows us in idle scene mode to say, well, there's not motion in this area, I don't need it, I don't need that quadrant, right? I'm gonna save some storage. We also have HDSM technology on between the server and the client out out there at the workstation. So when I zoom in on this sign here, you're gonna notice it's a little fuzzy and then it snaps into clarity, right? That's our <clears throat> HDSM technology working because I'm recording 16 megapixels across this incredibly large area, two blocks long, but when I pull in and ask for that detail, it's gonna provide it for me when I, when I ask for it. It's gonna dynamically switch between that low res and high res. Meanwhile, Recorded video, always available in high res. So I'm gonna take this one camera and uh, adapt it here a little. We're gonna do something that a Vigilon can do on just about any camera. I'm gonna take and multiply this by five. So this one camera is now is providing these five different streams. And now if I need to know who's on the island on this side, I can figure that out. I can figure out who's on the island on this side. Maybe down here, I want to know who's touching the, the walk button on this side. And on this side, I'm going to give us the walk button on this side of the, uh, interf or the uh, intersection, right? So now, I'm basically asking this camera to do the work of five different cameras. And it's basically recording this entire large area. This is really known as a PTZ killer because, you know, if I'm just a passive user of my system, I can just have the confidence that everything is being recorded. Whether it's close, far, side to side, I have it available. I'm not relying on a PTZ to go track somebody down. Although we do have auto tracking, but certainly, uh, you know, it's a different concept. <coughs> PTZ is great for a live operator, um, and honestly, we don't see it too often in schools because not everybody has a security center that's going to drive PTZs around the yard. But let's go back to the uh, the views here. I have my camera tree on the left. I can scroll in, I can search for a, a 16 megapixel pro camera, and it's gonna bring those to the top for me. It's gonna highlight them. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about our uh, video analytics. There's a couple things that are happening continuously. Those video analytics are, are able to do event-based analytics. That means that we can program in the area of view uh, a geofenced area. So now that classified object, that car or person, once they cross over that line, now we can activate uh, rules and alarms uh, that can trigger anything from flash of light 
to play a pre-recorded sound, to bring that message over the two-way radio to the, the correct talk group. So that's really what we're trying to do without having to sit there and watch live video. Uh, so there's multiple different event-based analytics, like object loitering basically allows us to draw in an area. If we have one person there, maybe, fine. If we have two people, you want to know about that, there's two people in the dock hanging out, we're going to tell you about it. Um, object enters area. And when you know COVID lockdown first happened, there's nobody in the building anymore, they drew this box around the visitor parking, and basically anybody time anybody showed up, they'd tell the front receptionist, uh, hey, time to go to the front desk, somebody's here at the building. Uh, object crossing beam, pretty self-explanatory, right? Somebody jumps the fence, we're gonna tell you. <coughs> Either way, it's easy to program, up, down, sideways. Uh, all the way around the block. Direction violated, this could be super helpful in say like a bus drop off area, right? You have somebody that thinks they're cute and they keep driving down the wrong way. Well, here's my evidence, right? I found it just like that and I notified, got notified the next time that you do it, right? So I'm out there and uh, came right over my radio. I can take care of it right there. I don't have to be in the building. Uh, enter occupancy area was part of what Vigilon did as a response uh, to the COVID lockdown, right? So we were presented with a bunch of challenging conditions and a vigilant came up with no mass detection, uh, occupancy counting, and a couple other things like adding body-worn cameras and contact tracing uh, as a response to COVID. And they did that as just a free update. It was just like 7.10. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, they brought like a, a bunch more analytics, a bunch more functionality for the system to help our customers deal with adverse conditions. And that's really kind of, you know, speaks to the what Motorola is. And we're trying to, when we look at the, the um, you know, the, uh, what do they call it, the company motto, right, is help people be their best in the moment that matters. And we're trying to do that on multiple different levels. But yeah, so you guys picked up on that. So the dot, the dots, the seven dot tens, twenties, those are free. Right. Right. So. The other thing the cameras are doing is the analytics are applied to basically every single scene. You put the camera out there, two weeks later it's figured out what normally happens. And when something weird happens, like somebody's on top of the vending machine, we're going to tell you about it because that's unusual. It's unusual motion, unusual activity. Uh, that's what the AI and the cameras is doing. It's calculating the speed, how many objects are in a particular area. So when we see 20 people rush to the back of the room, we can tell you about it. Or even that one one person goes running around, the, running through the cafeteria. Camera's like, ah, that doesn't look normal. People don't run through here. It's going to let you know. Yeah, one kid shoves another kid. You know that's not normal. <laughs> it's yeah. going to the cameras to say, you might want to pay attention to this. Hmm. So this, you know, this RFI that we're doing, that'll turn into an RFP for two new schools, middle school, you know, and a year after that. You know, we could look at an individual solution that goes end to end. And so you're talking through these cameras now that you can put in to solve that problem. Can you talk to me a little bit about the AI? And I know we, we visited a little bit, but just, yeah. for, just, for, just for reference, can you, can you go through that on our existing structure? Because it, as memory was stating, we would retrofit this to the other nine locations. Yeah. What type of AI exists? We have Hanwha primarily, you know, across yeah. the district from, you know, um, uh, fish eyes to multi-directional to direct, so exactly. can you talk through that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So the H5A cameras have our next generation analytics built into the camera where it processes that metadata at the edge. So it can look and classify an object and then also detect what type of metadata we're collecting. Is it the color of the car, the upper body, lower body clothing color, gender, those types of things get added into that, to that frame of the video. And that's processed and sent to the video recorder and then on that server side, we're able to do those searches. We also, so just so you know that we don't have to put in only our cameras. We can take your existing cameras, take that video stream, process it through our AI appliance, and get the same result, right? So even though you have those cameras out there, they um, you know, can you know, stay in their position as long as you feel comfortable that that camera is providing you your security objective. If, uh, for instance, like you have old analog cameras or cameras that just aren't doing what they need to be doing, often we see customers choose to go to an analytic camera because there is cost associated to processing that on the backside. There is a, 
a video analytic channel license that goes along with adding those analytics to a non-analytic camera. So if that camera's out of warranty, doesn't do what it's supposed to do, let's look at that area and maybe add a fisheye or a dual head or something that's gonna provide you the information you're looking for. And you can repurpose that other camera exactly. somewhere else that, that, that might not need analytics right. or needs less yeah. resolution. But the quick answer is that AI and VR mm -hmm. would be perfect solution for exactly. uh, taking over those Hanwha cameras and reusing those sure. for the next whatever three years. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah and again, you know, this is this is all about new schools right here. So yeah. you know that, that's what we're looking at. But again, to retrofit, we do have a, a pretty decent amount of money you know invested in the system that we have in place. Yeah, you know, and there's a hardware re, um, replacement cycle that, that everything is on anyways. And so right. looking at that. You know, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just wanting to, to make sure that all this cool stuff is something that we could benefit Absolutely. from in, in a different school too. So we like to say we're going to meet you where you're at. Right? Yeah. So if this is what you got and you want to reuse it, we can do that. Yeah. Great. But maybe truthfully, not every single camera needs analytics either, right? So maybe there's a camera in a hallway where you have analytic cameras at all your choke points and your traffic directors so that maybe that camera at the other end of the hallway, maybe you just need motion detection. So we could put in an H5 SL, which is just a standard light camera. It's more economical, doesn't have the analytics built in, or maybe we don't need to apply analytics to some of those existing cameras. Could save you some cost in the long run. Sure. Um, but let's talk about appearance search and how we deploy this in the system, right? I just mentioned choke points, and that's really the critical place that you want to have analytics. Because when you're running things like appearance search, appearance search works on recorded video. So essentially, from that point forward or backward, you're gonna have the ability to track somebody across a faci you know, facility uh, and in the site. Um, actually, in ACC8, we'll be able to track across all the buildings in the district from one appearance search. Um, but it's different than facial recognition in that a facial recognition is and license plate recognition are the only two analytics that we charge extra for. They are licensed per camera but they don't ever need to be upgraded. So essentially, if you were to activate facial recognition on your system, you could do it in any particular cameras you want, but typically we see it at a choke point because it works in real time. That means that if I'm recognized on that camera, I can you know, go to a watch list. I'll show you that here in a second. It means I'm gonna pull up that instant notification. But it's a user-defined database. Uh, if we were to just go through that watch list, uh, I can quickly and add pictures to it, but it's up to me, the end user, uh, to identify that image. We're not going through you know, high school yearbooks to say, this is Johnny, this is Jim. Uh, we're not doing mug shots. We're not going out to the internet to do it. You guys might be using student ID pictures, but it's up to you to add the name to it. So we're not uh, you know, doing what Amazon does. I think this is an important point. It's a user-defined database. You guys manage that. You put in what you're looking for and what you want to do with that data. Uh, we were all very excited when we heard facial recognition was coming out. We wanted, we're like, schools are going to love this. Everybody, every school's going to want this, right? Uh, then this little privacy thing start to come up. You know, uh, we see a lot of it in California. It's, re it's really redefining, and schools are like, well, hang on a second. And there's certain regulations you have to meet. So we can do it. It's probably going to be more difficult on your policies and procedure ends in figuring that out. Uh, but know that this is a biometric versus the, uh, the appearance search is not a biometric. So appearance search is not collecting any what they would consider personal data where a, a facial rec really is. So you want to just keep that, that in mind as you're moving forward. We have it. It's available. And we would love for you to use it. Yeah. We're usually finding obstacles in the privacy issues. So. Yeah. And honestly, we have a lot of customers that ask about this. They just want to try it. And we do that. We can offer you... Uh, that LPR or uh, facial recognition license as a trial period, right? It doesn't have to, you know, be an all or nothing type of scenario. Um, but going back to appearance or facial recognition, I'll show you that in a second, but let's just kind of walk through some of these other things here too, uh, that the Vigilon cloud service, Jen talked about so fondly that, you know, it, it is super helpful. It means that you're gonna get your, you know, notifications pushed to your mobile app. So when you get a recognition hit, you know, maybe you're not person, the person that has the radio, but you know, it will show up on your phone as well. Mobile app's free as well. Yep. Yeah. You just need a camera license. Cool. 
So a lot of these we're going to address in live demos. So let's let's go take a look at some cameras. I'm going to pull up uh, just a demonstration video of a uh, particular camera to start with. Um, let's see. I'm going to pull up a 12 megapixel fisheye for my friends over at the Lodge Casino, and uh, we'll take a look at, at what this camera does for situational awareness. You guys are using some fisheyes now. Yes. Uh, any. Warping issues? Do you like those? Um, yes and no. Okay. Uh, they, they serve a purpose. There's a couple of uh, spots where it's a little bit weird. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a couple of spots where it's, it's pretty helpful. Yeah. So, a lot of times we, we talk with people about the fish eye and they're like, oh, I hate fish eyes. You know, they've had yeah. not a, such a great experience with it. Uh, we do some very unique things here on how it dewarps. Just and it is like yeah. that. You don't have to do anything with it except get the camera feed and then draw your box around what area you yeah. want to see it. So I think this is this show this uh, that feature what Kyle was saying where we could populate several views with one camera really shows well with this fish eye. So you, you saw that original sort of native view there where it's all fish eye looking. He's now divided it up into four different views. Uh, again, one camera in a, in sort of in a centralized area that has traffic going north, south, east, west. You can very easily pan, tilt, zoom, right exactly. from the click of a mouse. So I know this isn't a school, but the idea being that you know we're able to do more with less. The Lodge Casino went from 800 cameras to 400 cameras by using the fisheye. I don't know if you've been there like two consecutive weeks, but they move the machines all around. They don't have to move the cameras because it gives them the ability to always be able to pan around and be adaptable to those changes. So if we need to you know, just zoom in, uh, that situational awareness quality is going to give them what they need to determine, right? It might not be definitive evidence about what's on the slot machine, but that's not what they're asking the, the camera to do, right? They're, they're trying to find out where this guy went to after he was at this machine. So just being able to click on that, do find appearances after this, is really kind of the, the power of doing more with less. Which brings up the other point, so the fisheye camera has analytics now in it. We're one of the only ones doing that. So now that we understand what classified objects do, and how we're collecting that metadata. Let's go, you know, we understand that we can set up an analytic event in a field and trigger an alert. Let's look at, like, what happens, well, I missed one of those alerts, right? Let's, let's do an appearance search real quick. This is one of our customers. Uh, it's a natural museum in British, Bank, or British Columbia. Uh, they have about eight cameras that they lent to us for this uh, test shot, and it produced some video for us. We've got this guy, who is reported as being super suspicious, he's got a backpack on, um, you know, he's got a, a person with him, he's got his hands in his pockets all the time. Uh, they just don't know what he's up to. So they need to find out where he went after this piece where we found him on video. So this bounding box gives us the option, click before this or after this. So I'm going to find appearances after this. And so what it's doing now, all that AI metadata that landed on the server is now getting tagged and it's all searching through that. So that's that GPU that Jim was talking about performing that search for us. Uh, and then the AI has brought back the most relevant images to you know, help us through our search. So what I want to do is tell the AI, well, this is the guy I'm looking for. This face profile tells me I got a pretty good image to start with. So I'm going to star some of these images. And I'm going to basically just add those to the list. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit more. This one looks like the guy, right? I'm gonna open that in the investigation view, play that video. That white box that we saw uh, is the AI telling us that that's the person that we're looking for, right? Uh, but it looks really fuzzy, right? Like you're probably going, well, what is the, cam the quality of these, these Vigilant cameras? I'm like, they're the smart cameras that even the two megapixel can find this dude way back in the scene. So as a human scrubbing video, that had been probably pretty hard to pick up, actually, right? It might have been that defining piece of evidence, and I'm going to add it to my list by just starring it. I'm going to update my AI. This bar down here tells me, well, I've got like matches farther down the timeline. Do you want to extend that? And now we'll see the bar on the bottom, the timeline, get extended out. So now those little clips are getting extenuated to the timeline. And so I'm going to change also the relevance to search for the entire site to relevance per camera. So now, if I know my layout, and I know where to look, I can say here he is at the second floor circulation, 
Now I've got them at the first floor hallway. Here he is at the second floor stairwell. We've got him pretty good. The exhibit, we got him. This looks like him at the second floor hallway. Yep, that's him, star that one. Uh, we're gonna collapse that down. Here he is at the first floor circulation desk. I'm gonna add that in. And uh, that looks like that looks like about done, right? And you, you guys can notice that there's other people in this similarity search that kind of match that general description, but it's really part of Motorola's decision to keep the human in the AI loop, right? We wanna provide the, the best information as fast as we can, but we really need that human judgment to determine that, yes, this is the person that I'm contributing to this investigation. So I'm gonna star those continue, uh, as well. And now they've all landed on my timeline. When I feel like my investigation is pretty complete, I've you know, searched everything out, and uh, I'm ready to export, I'm just gonna click this button here, opens another tab for me, and I, now I've got the ability to look through all those videos that I start, and they're gonna play continuously, back to back to back, chronologically, uh, if I need to adjust this one because you know somebody else was doing something weird in this uh, scenario, I can just take the, uh, the bars and move out my bookends pretty simply. I can adjust that. And now, I feel like this is pretty pretty complete. When I export this, oh, I forgot there's that one uh, non-analytic camera at the end of the hallway. I can go to that camera now and know that he was in between, uh, in that hallway between these two clips. I can go to that camera find him there, bring him and that clip into this same file. So now when I export this, it's gonna give me this California statement. I'm gonna to have to say yes, of course. And now I can go and select and put this on a drive somewhere in a, in a, uh, in a file, and then uh, I can select that folder. And then it's gonna start calculating and start automatically exporting that video for me. I have a couple formats I can choose from. Um, I can you know, choose from the AVE, uh, format, which is our native format, basically is going to include the Avigilon player with that export. So when I send it off to law enforcement, they're going to be able to authenticate that just by running the authenticate images. It's going to calculate all the images, make sure that it has not been tampered with. All of the uh, files are digitally signed so that basically you can prove that this is still ver verified accurate evidence. The video could also be exported in things like an AVI file or other things, but once you do that, uh, it's no longer authenticated. So it has to be exported uh, in our file format and used with our player, and that keeps that, uh, that authenticity together. But, you know, you might have something you just want to share with the principal at the school to just send them a clip. So that's why there's that feature. Cool. So... Uh, let's head over to an, another couple things here. Let's go to the focus of attention interface. And what this is, is basically just a, a great way for a passive user to be involved in their system. So if, rather than watching my video, I'm asking the smart cameras to bring the information. The hexagons uh, represent the Vigilon video, or the cameras connected to the system. They could represent different schools, uh, groups of cameras, exterior, interior, however you want to arrange it. But it gives me a great visual representation of what's the status of my system. The black cameras are not connected. I should probably, uh, there you are, Lydia. What's going on with that camera? How come it's not connected, right? I might want to call Vigilant Tech Support next step, you know, to find out, oh, well, uh, you know, what's the, the troubleshooting process on this? But the gray cameras are cameras that are connected. They're just idle in the scene. Blue is motion, and then when we have alarms go on, that's when we, uh, we'll see the, the hexagons change color, and we'll see those um, different types of things happen, whether it's the facial recognition, whether it's the license plate recognition. Um, you know, it's gonna be able to bring that information to you instantly. We'll cl we'll, um, let's close this one off for a second here. But when I have that focus of attention interface rolling, I'm gonna have that information come in. The alarms can be prioritized. Meanwhile, the, those um, you know, unusual activity events are gonna be coming in here as well. So whether it's you know, something I need to respond to right away or just you know, clear out some of these videos, like what's going on in here, uh, I can replay this right now, figure out do I need to respond to this? 
Uh, looks like it's just somebody coming to work. Um, those top two alarms, that's where well, that's our facial rig? Yep, that exactly. work. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you had that wig on. <laughs> or is that back when you yep, had we'll, hair? Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, but <laughs> in this part, you know, we can basically now collaborate with somebody else on the video system. So if I need to hey, say, say, hey, Steve, is this the guy that took your catalytic converter? You'd be like, yeah, that's him. Get him, right? And, uh, you know, I could, you know, open that in another view. That gives me the ability to, you know, walk into that clip. Uh, get that person, pull that in, um, take a snapshot, and then that's going to export as well. So now I can have this image that I can email, text to anybody else on the network. Um, but being able to collaborate with somebody instantly uh, on the net, you know, on the same system, super duper helpful. I'm going to close that one particular up. And, uh, oh, uh, well, we could go right to that and, and bookmark it. But let's take a look at these two alarms, right? So you can see that, you know, they're both coming in on this particular camera. Uh, but one, you know, the pictures don't match, right? Uh, that's basically because I have in that watch list, I've got two lists going on. I've got a bad watch list, and then I've got a good list. So I don't know if you guys saw that the, um, the lights flashed as well, but essentially, you know, you can create either list and have different outcomes for either. So, you know, I just said, you know, put the wig on and took a picture just to prove that, you know, the facial recognition is still going to work, uh, even if you try to disguise yourself in some manner. Um, maps can be, a, a, well, let's look at this view because this is what popped up, uh, you know, when we had that event go on. I'm going to go back here to. How long does it take you guys to uh, run Genetech and go do uh, video um, searching? It depends. I mean, it's, it's variable. You know, um, we get the information from a school looking for a specific thing, you know, and they, they typically have a range, you know, you know, this thing happened before 8 o'clock or whatever. Right. And so I can go to the appropriate camera. And, and then, but then, then it's me looking at it. So, but, I, how, however long it takes me to, to, to review the clip. So but as you see, it's pretty quick here. Yeah, you know, a lot quicker than Genetech would be. Right. That's one of the nice things about appearance search, and we've always kind of brought it up, whether it's a school or, or a, a shopping mall or something. Say someone comes up and say, "Hey, I've, I've lost my child. Mm -hmm. I think they had khaki shorts on and, and a red shirt." Mm -hmm. well, immediately, you can go in there and start doing that. And the nice thing about it, that as you saw at the bottom, it gives you. It shows you on those specific places where that camera was, and now you can start seeing this is the path they're taking to the building. So, with you, literally within before they to get out of the building, or within within minutes, you right. can you can narrow down exactly pretty much where they are. So, how, how dynamic? Because one of the things that we have with the system now, and I, and I didn't mention it before when Lydia asked about things that I don't like, and, and again, that's what I don't know, right? So we have different events that are set up and different things that we can do, and so that's great. But when an event happens that maybe we didn't have programmed, that's different. So when I look at you, Kyle, and you're showing this demo, and, and it's that, that recognition, so that, that looks like it's on the fly. So this is something now that you need to do. So you go to that camera, and, and you can click that, and then it gives you the ability to create the, let's find this person before, find this person after. Right. That doesn't have, that's not programmed before. That's, that's real time, me looking at the system saying, this is what I needed to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. exactly. And that's so that bottom so no, no pre-programmed anything. I don't have no. to worry about that. That's something yeah. that you're creating a whole storybook from point A to point B, right. and right. it might cover five cameras. You didn't know that to start with, mm -hmm. but you that person was way over here to start with, and they're the ones that started the fight because they threw the apple at the kid. Sure. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about it is like with the face watch, like he's showing on the fly. So if you have a child or something. You can pull up the video, is this the person? Yes, that's the person. Put a box around them, mm -hmm. throw them into the face watch list room immediately, and now the next camera that sees them has face watch enabled, this is gonna just let you know. I mean, it's literally that quick. Sure. And that's how that works. I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, and we had aisles of, it was, a, it was a vendor conference, and people were walking up and down the aisles just for your unusual motion detection. So they had people walking up and down the aisles and looking at different displays and stuff. Well, at one point in time, they set up uh, food right there in one of those aisles. And all of a sudden, I started getting these unusual motion and unusual activities. 
what it was is that camera within 12 hours, the day, the evening before, saw all these people walking up and down these aisles. Well, now they had people standing in that aisle. And it says this isn't right because I'm used to people walking up and down there. So within 12 to 24 hours, it was throwing up alarms like crazy saying that these people aren't supposed to be standing here. So you immediately can get into the loitering, you can get into too many people in an area, you can get all those different, gra that granular with those things. And, sure. and, and the camera learned it on itself. We didn't tell the camera to do that, the camera just learned it on its own. But did you have to tell the camera to let you know that though? Uh, no, it's, so it's set up for unusual motion, so we basically, it just started So when did you set that up, how did you set up the unusual motion, I guess is what I'm asking. So what, so. Because I assume it's gonna grab a lot of stuff and some of it right. I might care about, some right. of it so, might not. So what this, what is, what's on these is, it was called self-learning self analytics. So with these, all these cameras, as soon as you put up an H5A camera or it has analytics on it, it's gonna start learning the scene. So it's gonna learn the scene. It's gonna know people sit in here. Um, and then if you come in here and you start rearranging stuff or you got people to do different things, it's learned that scene and it knows now, okay, there's an anomaly in this scene. That's not right. That's what I'm saying. It, it, for hours, it was used to people walking this aisle and now it had people just standing there. So that's part of our unusual activity is Okay, I'm used to, I've learned this scene, I know that people are supposed to be walking, but now that people are standing there, so I'm gonna let you know that something's not right here. Now it's up to me to go look at that and say, it's okay, they're getting food now, or it's okay, they're standing there, or they stopped or whatever, so. So that um, unusual motion detection, or what Jim's talking about, that sort of just happens automatically with the camera. The analytics, there is some programming that needs to go into that on the front end. Sure. That camera's set up, to, again, back to that security situation. What is this camera supposed to do? You put that, programming into that, your integrator is going to do that for you, or you could do do that on your own through the training. Um, there is a setup there. Sure. But once that's set up, then oh, you're good to go. To yeah, then you're good to go. As far as the searches go, you don't have to do anything. It's picking up that metadata that that's that person, that's that vehicle. Kyle showed it from an image, but you could also do a search based on those characteristics. Can you show that real quick? Like, uh, if I'm looking for a, a lady, female, uh, adult with a red top on and blue uh, blue jeans. I would simply go into a, a, a parent search, click those things: gender, uh, hair color, age. Age is really height of uh, of the person, and then. Uh, <laughs> so sure. so, yeah, it's not like that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We have several children. Sure. After it's child. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> so you could just put these characteristics in there, and, and by the way, you could do this with a vehicle too. So if you're looking for sure. a yellow bus, sure. uh, you could click these images, put your timeline in there, and it will search just based on that character. So we don't even have to have an image right. at that point. So uh, you can manually do this. We talk about, uh, the zoo uses this a lot, where a child gets separated from their mother, and the child goes to security, I lost my mom. They quickly go onto the system, tell me a little bit about your mom. Well, she's got the red jacket on and blue jeans. They put those characteristics in there, they find her, they radio over, yep, yeah, hey, let that let that lady know we have her son here at the security. So and that happens very quickly. And the nice thing about that is you can do it across sites. So you can, it's not just like this server, that server. So if you've got all your in here, like you saw in there, you can pick the different cameras. So say, for example, as I've, I've seen, it's been integrated, one of the things they had is they had a person driving through parking lots of different schools, but you can highlight that car. Now you can search that car through different facilities and say okay the car went from here to here to here to here so now you can start tracking those types of things and seeing what's going on we've got a couple of minutes left I don't want to hijack the whole thing so Trevor yeah. you guys because one of the things I'm curious about Kyle I mean you know you talk about the integration of the radio you know you talk about set, so, so set up like an event for me that shows hey if if you know, we see this person, I want to alert the radio and send an email. Can you, can you walk me through what that looks like real quick? Yeah, absolutely. That's handed it over to Cody. I want to make sure before we do that, because I have to hand over the, uh, the video to him, that we have a significant amount of questions completed. That ACC, as you guys see it, is easy to use for recorded video as well as uh, for peer and search and uh, viewing live stream as well. Did we, with the pro camera, you guys are hopefully convinced that we can see live cameras. Um, for recorded video, exporting the video, pretty easy. Export it like you normally would, have a policy around that. You can bookmark the video so that if we were to um, you know, build a, an investigation here or take some recorded video from a particular camera, uh, I can click on recorded here. I can just add a bookmark here just by clicking bookmark. Now I have the ability to protect this bookmark or make this bookmark private. So when I click private, it basically means that uh, the administrator can see it, 
but the operators in a different user group that don't have the rights cannot see it, right? So I want to let you know that there are rule-based access that goes along with ACC, just like ACM, so that uh, basically, you know, Cody can see some cameras. Jim can see all the cameras, right? Uh, all of that is easy to set up by him, you know, just like adding people to groups and rules, uh, making sure that they can see the, the right people get to see the right things. And that's AD integrated, I assume? Yes. So yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. So all those permissions can be set up. You remove some, somebody that leaves the district, you remove their permissions in AD, now it's going to filter to video and access control, so their card's not going to work, their login's not going to work. Okay. Um, and then the next question I've got is, because you just mentioned it we're live, and, and maybe you said it and I just missed it because I was thinking about something else. Um, so you go back and so you say, okay, the zoo example or whatever, you know, and they, they highlight somebody or, or whatever, and you say show after. Yeah, does it does it go through the recorded video, but then does it go to live? Does it monitor? It won't see live. It's up to the second. Up to the so. So an appearance yeah, yeah. search appearance search works on recorded video, right? But up to the second. Okay. But it's, as long as it's on the server uh, on that thing, it will search and find right. that. So you're not um, going to see me now, but you're going to see me now. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's sort of. Yeah. So technically, right. it goes off a recorded video. Yeah. But things like right. facial recognition, license plate, that's lot. That's based on live video. Is that that is looking at it, right. but as soon as it's recorded, which it is instantly, right. then we can run the appearance. Right. If, if we were in a also. Uh, situation, right, <laughs> like an active shooter or something, can we actively track someone through the building, or do we have to like manually change cameras to know to like anticipate their path? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and I would use you'd use appearance search to do that. Again, it's up to that sec up to that second, so you want to keep refreshing that as it's as it's going. So we do have tracking with our PTZ camera where it will automatically track that person once an analytic event is uh, but triggered. only within that camera? Only, yeah, because that camera moves, right? The other cameras like the Pro is a fixed camera. Uh, so we're taking that big scene and then that would be picked up within the appearance search yeah, and find that person. BDSD had a recent event that you could ask the security director there how they resolved it quickly and easily and uh, a good success. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Yes. So we're not going to be, say we do go with the Vigilant, we won't be replacing all of our cameras with the Vigilant cameras because we have an installed base, right? Um, without the analytic cameras or that stuff installed on the camera, it's going to take processing power. Saying that it's going to be able to process all of that information to be able to give us all the analytics we want under a second, it's very hard for me to believe. So how much processing power are we gonna to need to be able to analyze all that data from cameras that aren't analytic cameras? That's where our design tool comes in. <laughs> so we'll put, take those cameras, those existing cameras, those resolution, what, what format they are, put them in the design tool, and then it'll size the NVR that's appropriate for that. Uh, that's gonna be our AI NVR for the scenario that you're talking about that will process that. So we're gonna size that based on how many cameras you have, what the resolution is, what type of camera it is. And it will tell us how long it will take for uh, that video to get analyzed? It, it, it won't tell you, but just like, I mean, so what you're seeing, what the, what the AI appliance, the AI NVR does, is it basically takes what you see on native on our cameras, the analytics are yeah. put in our cameras, and it literally, it brings that video through processes as quick as what the camera will, and pushes it on the NVR. So it's, it's still real time, it's still being able to process, to process that data. Uh, just as well, maybe even faster, because it's it's in a big box. I mean, it's got the hardware and the processing power it needs to be able to process all those video streams at once and push them out to where to, to the recorded. And that's else. all it's doing. It's not doing anything else. Yeah, it's not doing anything. It's not it's not recording anything. So that it, AR. So we've got two different AI appliances. We got an AI excuse me, AI appliance and an AI NVR. AI NVR brings it in and records it locally. The AI appliance basically you're just pushing data through it adding on the metadata that what you would typically see on one of our cameras, adding that on top of that and pushing it onto that video stream and pushing it onto wherever your storage location is. Okay, so that would be that would be an in-between. So if we have yes. cameras that are not analytic, yes. we would focus them onto the AI appliance. Yes. It would do the near real-time transcoding and metadata overlay. analysis. Overlay, yeah. Overlay. 
and then forward that onto uh, the NVR. The NVR. And it's so would we would we need one of those at every school if we had that, or centralized, and then it would push it out to the school if we had an NVR? And school? there's options to that. And I was thinking about that as you guys as we were talking about it. Since you don't really, not every camera is going to need the analytics, probably. What you could do is you could centralize that. We prefer it to be closer, but if you want to centralize the AI appliance at one place, bring the video stream in. Uh, and, and, and do it that way. It all depends on where you're going to be recording at, is, is, and that's kind of the logistics and the, and the layout of how. And that's something we can we can talk and, and help design to to be able to optimize that, um, to be able to bring that in. And that yep. makes well, it depends on your latency as well, right? Yeah, so right. if you want to centralize one, that, yeah. you have to have that network. Well, we got, we got big pipes. Okay, so as long yeah, schools do it. They're yeah, doing it now. So, but I want to emphasize that it really is dependent on the the camera to the recorder or the AI appliance. Uh, what that latency is. So a lot of times we do see them central, you know, on premise at the school versus centralized, and, but it can be done. Yeah. It, it is being done. Uh, I wanted to also mention that I know it's hard to believe, but the metadata, that file is very small. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's not the metadata that I'm worried about adding that to the file. Yeah. It's the analysis of it. That, that, that's the, the computationally expensive part of it, right? Yeah. Like, so every single frame of every, uh, of, of the camera's footage needs to get analyzed, mm -hmm. right? And so that, that's processor intensive. Yep. And if we have 100 of those running through one box, I'm worried about that not being enough juice. Yeah. Well, there, well we, we do have limitations. We have to design it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, AI appliance can process 30 cameras uh, of video analytics, and that's based on a two megapixel. It can actually go up to 50, but it comes with enough licensing attached to the box that it can process 30 for that uh, the price that we would tell you about. Yeah. So for every 30 non-analytic cameras, we would need one box. Correct. A, a, a About. About, yes. yes. Okay. But that's what I'm saying is, is maybe you maybe we'll just as the design goes, you're saying, okay, I don't need analytics here, 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 so you don't have to bring all your cameras, or maybe you want analytics. Um, I mean, it's and to give you an example of, of kind of the, the how this can scale or how it can work is I worked with Baton Rouge Police Department uh, a couple years ago, and they actually had all throughout the city had all their cameras, a lot of PTZs on poles and did cellular back to, and we ran all of those through an AI appliance and then dumped it onto an NVR. And it, 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 it worked well. I mean, it was applying analytics to these, and some of them were not even a two megapixel camera. Now, I'm not saying this, so there are, but there are limitations that I will specifically say that. Well, the higher the megapixel, the more processing it's gonna be, right? right? True, so for like, the video, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so like, it, it's, just, it's just interesting. I was trying to figure out how much, how many more, appliances or how much more equipment we would have to purchase and that will come through if we end up uh, through the RFI, through the RFP process, yes. seeing how much it would cost. But I just wanted to kind of get an idea of, of processing cost. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So, well, yeah, there are limitations in that box. You're not just going to be as many cameras as you want to put on and it's 30 to 50 and then if you've got 100 cameras, maybe you need two boxes for that. Okay. You know. What I also wanted to show you real quick was a system site health reporting. So not only is this available at a vigilant cloud service, but it's always in the client as well for those administrator level customer uh, operators. The, um, you know, the idea here is that it can tell you all the details that you need to gather about your system, all your IP addresses. Uh, it's even gonna tell you uh, a particular camera, the serial number, Mac ID, and what analytics are applied to that camera as well. So, all that information can be exported in, as, to a PDF or in a CSV file. So if you needed to say like run an inventory report on all your uh, devices connected to your Vigilant system, it's as easy as exporting that CSV file. And we could do, uh, we have a demo pool as well, so we can give you and lend some equipment. We have to go through our partner, but we can lend that equipment to you for 30 days. We can hook it up, test it, play with it, and make you a believer <laughs> if you want. Before I buy health report, so, real quick, I yeah. want to just kind of point out something that uh, I've always is, uh, is the engineering part. Um, so you click on the and then you click on uh, the demo site. Make sure on the demo site, the uh, Allen demo site. So you scroll down um, and you look at the down to the NIC, the network adapters. So you see what you've got: 300, 302 megabytes coming in, and you've got look at what's going out here of these different people. So you've got all this. So if you go to um, just go to a view. And make sure you're on the Allen demo site. Click, just click on it up here. He's and, and, top. So they go collaboration. Click on the collaboration button here. And then just hit the down button. You can see all these people are actually at this demo site right now. 
So we're bringing 300 megabytes worth of data, but going out was what, uh, a couple megabytes maybe going out. And these people are all remote. So that's one of the benefits of our HDSM, smart codec and the HDSM is we're bringing all this in, but we're sending out those, those streams that just kind of situational awareness. So we're not consuming a lot of bandwidth until you need to consume a lot of bandwidth to be able to be granular. So, sorry, just going to point that out. That's a great point. Um, did you guys, so we saw a peer and search. <clears throat> Let's connect it to identity search so you guys understand what a vigilant does. It's different than others when we can unify our access control to um, to the uh, to the video, and I'm just signing in here. Just should just take a second. Kyle out signs in. Just a quick question. You showed that camera serial number and all of that. I assume the firmware's there. I yeah. can push firmware from there. Uh, yeah. So all those cameras are appropriate. Just put the firmware on the side. And push it. Actually, if nope. you were to do an update, like an individual on AI NBR, it's just one download from a vigil, <coughs> which is a signed and encrypted package. Okay. It's going to deliver this this the Linux OS. It's going to deliver this. So, uh, Vigil on server software update, it's going to deliver the client updates, and then it's going to push automatically the firmware for Vigil on cameras. For third party cameras, you're going to have to uh, go okay. download this. No, I, 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 get it. I get it. Okay, great, thank you, cool. Um, I'm going to turn on the cards here, and in this video view, we have a card wheel uh, where we're you know spinning cards past this little doodah on this wheel here, and it looks like it's Friday, which means somebody broke it. <laughs> um, but essentially, what we're looking for is that, you know, this is just replicates a card reader at a door, right? We've got a camera there. We can see that that person is walking up to it. How do we get that to go with us? I was going to start again. No, oh, it's a little, the dot there. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, somebody broke it. Okay. <laughs> um, but it, what we're looking for is we're going to go to recorded video. We're going to search on identities. And so I could type in uh, Ryan, and it's going to bring back how many all the different Ryans that we have in our system. Uh, I'm going to click Ryan Ritter, and I want to search for a particular date range, uh, not all the way back from 2022. Let's get something a little bit more recent. Uh, let's go from March 1st to March 3rd. We're going to search on this for all the doors. And it's going to, to search for three days here, and it's going to bring back those results. And so this is that camera view, just like we saw in appearance search. It's the view of the camera. If this was an actual person walking up to the door, we're going to get that classified object box. So I would just click on that, and now I'm into an appearance search on that person. So basically, I've gone from searching all my badge reads right to now I'm doing appearance search and video in the same customer, in the same client, I'm on the same screen, I'm in the same program makes it super easy, super fast. And that's why, you know, if you're doing contact tracing, it's no sweat with a vigil on. That appearance search, because it's not facial recognition, especially on a person, it really can't go across days because they're gonna have different clothes on and stuff like that. Right. True, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but could a car look across multiple days? If yeah. a uh, well, appearance search starts with a 15 minute increment. So if you okay. find that person on video, it's going to search the next 15 minutes before or after, and then you're welcome to expand that Keep search. That. Right? So it really kind of you know, is a quick way to bring you probably the most relevant results first. It's a good point that you bring up. I mean, we were talking with some corrections facilities around that. Appearance search just doesn't work in there because you either have an orange jumpsuit on or you have blue <laughs> uniform on. And also, you're just, it's not it's really uh, appropriate for them. <laughs> yeah. uh, some other points I wanted to. Click, or click on before we pass off to Cody was mapping in ACC 7. They gave us just a preview of what's going to happen in ACC 8. Uh, basically, it gives us the ability to have like a, a Google style map where we can, you know, zoom in across the entire city, go to the, you know, uh, back down to Richardson as well, zoom in over there, get to their map, click on that, open that. Uh, there's a real simple, easy way to do maps as well. You can basically just take a uh, an image and make that into a map. So I took my daughter's school and uh, just turned that into a map so that it can also add instructions in there about what to do if this event happens. So I can, you know, if, if I get an alert on that camera, the camera is going to flash red. Uh, it's going to, you know, tell me to call security, and you know, I can see the other cameras in the area. So basically, with no training, I can understand the camera layout in the system, right? If I went back to the access control, hopefully it's still up there. I 
took it down. Uh, access control same deal. You can build a uh, you know a map of your school, picture of it, and put that unlock button on there. No training, right? Which which one says unlock on it? So, uh, you know, it's it's easy to build these systems so that they're kind of dummy proof or front front desk proof. Um, you know, and it's also easy to teach your people with free training about how to get the most out of the system. Constantly getting awarded uh, easiest to use software out there from yeah. publications like IPVM. If you're familiar with that, um, and these are integrators and end users that are doing the voting on yeah. that. So, but honestly, we were at the National School Resource Officer uh, Expo at the Gaylord last year, and you know, it kind of made me think, like, why, like, working for Motorola, we had ten or fifteen different school districts come up, and they're like, "We love your system; it helps us so much." There was a kid who got lost going to the bus, and we found him in like ten seconds. It just makes a difference. Sorry to get. Uh, Kyle, go back to your view, Seven. Um, when you guys get your drawings from your new schools, the the footprint itself, all we have to do is copy that in. And I think you were talking about labeling, mm -hmm. so we can label all the cameras that are in there instantly. And when you want to go see that camera, you just go click on it, and it pulls up that view. Or you could search for it very quickly in that little search bar in the upper left-hand corner, whatever. All of our cameras are listed by model number, but you can label those front door, elementary, school, you know. And then you could search for that real quickly in that search bar as well if you need to find a camera quickly. Yeah, I remember last week when we were discussing the ACM, how the map integration was perfect because we could label each location with just one of our uh, maps we would import into the system. Yep. So this door, this door, this door, this door. I was just wanting to, to double check to make sure the ACC, ACC? Yeah. ACC. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and when you, it had a similar aspect to yeah. it. So. When you guys write the RFP, put that in there, that this is what you want it to do. Because that takes the time to be able to build all that. You, you guys don't want to do it. Make the integrator do it. Right. Yeah. Um, Kyle, we need to make sure we cover the halo, too. I know they were interested in Oh, yeah. Stuff. Um, so, you guys, you guys, just like those um, facial recognitions are driving alerts, uh, Halo, we brought it, but Jim broke the power thing on it, so, um, but it, it does work normally, so for keywords, um, you know, like help, emergency, that is going to pick that up, gunshots, it's going to pick that up. Uh, THC, it so it's actually, so I've oh. got a set up for help hey, emergency, yeah, I've got a little light, red light, um, it actually caught him picking. But essentially, you know, it's going to um, pick that up and then drive those alerts through ACC, so you're going to get that instant dispatch about what's going on. We often see this where they put the halo sensor in, in a bathroom because there, you can't have any cameras in there, uh, but if somebody yells help emergency or it picks up vape or something, now it's going to send that alert straight to the radio. And then you can bookmark the cameras and make those live, pop open a live view here to bring in all that information. You know what the sensor, uh, what it sensed, and then it's gonna drive that so that you know, the SRO is just responding to that, or you know, security is gonna respond to that event. They don't have to go search through video to figure out who it was. They're now at the bathroom waiting for people to come out. So we're gonna have to put one of those off video. at every place that we wanna be able to have that type of recognition, or do the cameras have uh, microphones also. Well, we could talk about ACC8, but we don't know the exact details yet. I can tell you audio analytics are coming. Um, so do the cameras have uh, mics? Yes. yes. Some yes. of the, in ACC, or the H6 line, which this is the first H6, this year we'll see uh, the H6 SL line probably produced, which is gonna take the analytics from our H5A cameras and put them in our our, our non-analytic cameras, audio analytics are gonna be part of that. It's also gonna be a smart hub for like Z-Wave devices, all kinds of fun stuff. So it's, it's not available yet, but it, it's- Well, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Currently, the cameras have inputs for mic and outputs for speakers. Yeah. Our, our fisheye camera comes with a built-in microphone. I'm gonna pass it to you. Our, uh, yeah. corner, our corner mount camera has a built-in microphone. So those are the only two that have them built in. The others you would have to add the type of microphone. So like those two mic, the, those two cameras that have microphones, would that be able, with what we would purchase, would that be able to analyze and be able to pick up a gunshot or somebody saying help? Currently, no. 
in the future, yes. Okay, very soon. Yeah. And if, can I, you, if you want gun sight detection, we could do that through the Halo. We also integrate with uh, shooter detection. So there's some integrations with third parties that that's what those devices are made to do. Yeah. Uh, they're a little bit more detailed, but so th that's where that openness comes in. We can work with other parties that uh, make those devices for that. As far as vaping, are newer restrooms to be sensitive to like the political climate? The stalls are full floor to ceiling walls, so three sides. Door only has four inches top and bottom of opening. So I mean, they're almost independent rooms. How many do we need like a halo sensor in every freaking stall or is uh, one so in the center yeah. of the bathroom sufficient? So right now they're talking about like a, you need an eight foot tall ceiling, a normal height ceiling, uh, for a room like this size would be one halo sensor and you need to be at least one two by two square away from the ventilation. So if you think about where some people vape, it's usually in those stalls. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly probably be most likely a test scenario to find out. Yeah, if, there's uh, no if you put up one where you have the highest probability, it's going to give you all the readouts. You're going to be able to test that immediately to figure out if you need to. Um, but yeah, that you pull up a valid point. It's it's hard, right? Um, but typically, if you have air flowing through, that's what it, it needs. Yeah. Okay. And so if it goes floor to ceiling, but the door maybe has an opening crack between yeah. you, know, the vape has to be able to get out through there. Like sure. It will rise and it will spread like smoke. Okay. Like smoke weed. So. So yeah. If you had floor to ceiling and it was tight like that, and those you would technically need one in each one. But as soon as they open that door and if the air flowed out to that, we'd pick it up. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, so just bringing me back to this this slide that Lydia showed earlier. Uh, this is our entire <coughs> ecosystem today. Um, I actually think a couple of our newest acquisitions still are not on here, so this will continue to expand. Um, we now have Rave, Mo Rave Mobile Security that we acquired that does like panic button and um, mass notification. So you know we'll continue to integrate all these acquisitions that Motorola makes into our ecosystem and continue to expand on how they all tie together. Um, we're adding more stuff with like body worn video cameras being able to um, you know alert radios and actually um, you know, uh, integrate with the radios as well. Um, this year, so uh, all these things will just continue to get more tightly integrated. Um, but here at the center is Orchestrate, so I'm going to show you Orchestrate and um, how easy it is to use. Uh, the good thing is I got uh, what seven or eight minutes, and that'll that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here I'm going to pull up Orchestrate. So right here, uh, you can set this up. Uh, we have a, a huge demo radio system uh, that is in the hands of people like me across the country. And um, it's all tied together with our uh, the Richardson, uh, Texas demo of a Vigilant. Uh, but here's the different sites. So you could you know, list these as the different schools or whatever, and you can set up workflows for each individual school. Um, so I'm site 139. I went in and customized these uh, just this morning. And, uh, and you can go in and, and click into this um, uh, workflow that's already built for like a BOLO on the main campus. Um, and, and basically what this is is that if-then statement. So if this BOLO gets triggered, I want it to log an incident in our incident reporting software. Um, I want it to alert my radios. And, um, and then down here is it, this red is a, um, if it doesn't work, so if for some reason these radios aren't on the system or um, you know, the alert's not successfully sent to those radios, it's gonna alert a different group. So if there's any broken area, you could say alert IT because you wanna know that you need to go fix something. Um, so I'm gonna go in and, and just show you really quick. Uh, I'm gonna build a whole new um, workflow and uh, just show you how easy it is. So let's see, I'm going to go to site 139. I'm going to do a new workflow here. Um, so the triggers, these are all going to be uh, based on what's in your Vigilant system. So um, different analytic alerts, the things that you set up. Um, you, know, you can see here that there, there are a ton. Um, but I'm going to go, say, like a door. Um, and I guess we have the door door forced open, right? So I'm going to take this, I'm going to drag it over. This is going to be my trigger. Um, and then the actions are going to be basically tied, uh, tied to my radio system. So I want it to alert different users or I want it to log an incident. Um, you know, let's, let's say that we want to log an incident in our incident reporting software. I'm going to bring these together and just connect them like this. Um, let's zoom out a little bit so it's a little easier. And then I want it to alert, um, 
you know, I wanted to alert a specific unit or I wanted to alert a specific, um, a specific talk group. So um, West Maintenance is the one that's set up on this system, so I wanted to alert like that. I'm gonna alert that entire user group right there. And now these are tied together, so that's what the blue means. If I wanted to do that, um, if not successful, um, I would just click here. Um, hang on a second. Okay, not sure where the successful went. Um, but anyway, so I, I do that, and then I'm able to um, now create this workflow. I can go in and name it, uh, you know, door, door forced open. Um, and you can set these up by, like I said, individual schools, uh, individual instances of something happening. Uh, you can save it, you can turn it on. Um, so right now, this one would not be on until I click it on right here. So now this one would be working. And then turn it off if you decide you don't want it or you can modify it um, on the fly. So I'm gonna go back to now, I'm gonna create that alert. Um, and I'm gonna go into my uh, Vigilon system right here. So, uh, and there's all these acknowledgements going on because they're doing some demo testing with the concealed weapons detection. <coughs> um, but I'm gonna go in and so, uh, just because I can't force an analytic event to happen because it's tied to the Richardson location, I'm gonna do a keyboard command. Um, and I'm, like I said, this is tied to the radio system. So it's gonna do the loitering in the west parking lot. Um, and then I have that set up to alert specific units. I hope this isn't going to keep alerting because they're doing that testing. They're just going crazy for the CWD, aren't they, right now, Kyle? Perfect timing. Yeah, they are. <laughs> but to that end, that one that's saying knife detected, it's, is it literally just seeing and classifying a knife in someone's hand or whatever? And yeah, so CWD is uh, built by Evolve. Uh, when you add the uh, CWD part on it, it basically turns it into this, right? So we can take that notification, give it to the guard that's manning that unit, and even if that person um, you know, made it through uh, screening that day, and you put them on that uh, BOLO list, you can face wreck them and they're still going to get the notification. But to your point, there's a lot of technical specifications and jargon around that uh, CWD unit. It'd be great to uh, just do a demo on that product specifically. There's enough information that deserves it. What, what was your scenario if they had a knife? Um, yeah. yeah, knife or gun or whatever. Yeah, it, it, it'll actually have so, I mean, Yeah, it's, it's the way the system's set up is, is to detect those different types of shapes or things like that. So yeah, as, as you walk through that, it'll yeah. alert that. But it, it's really looking for weapons of destruction, not you know like a, a, a ceramic kitchen. Sure. One of the body alerts coming through at that one time just bundled it. Okay. Right, there you go. So these are text Loitering in West parking lot. So obviously these radios would be in different people's hands in different areas. Um, and we can customize these alerts within your your vigilant system so that it's concise. It's depending on whatever you know, uh, uh, you know motion detected on this camera or something. And so these alerts can come through as these uh, text messages, and then. Um, and then you can actually do a quick reply and acknowledge them, and um, used to be able to clear the clear the alert. But these can be alerted to individual users or an entire talk group. So if you wanted to alert two or three specific people in security at each school, you can set it up to do that as well. Um, so that's that sort of answer your question on how we do that, how we take the alert to the radios. You need this orchestrate piece to do that. The alerts or the alarms come into ACC. Those are programmed there for the camera to pick up whatever that is, the loitering. Then we can send that alert through yeah. to the radio through Orchestra. Right. Orchestra also ties together other systems, right? But I was just going to go there. So you know, if we've got the Motorola system, or you know, so we're using that now. So that's great. That the radios are there. It'll integrate with Active Directory. We can send emails. I assume we can alert all of that. 
we're, at, we're also having a conversation, you know, as part of this RFI process with uh, PA system as well as uh, emergency alert. Mm -hmm. And so looking at different ways. And so our, our, our ultimate situation would be one, that we could trigger something, you know, if, if this did this, then we would find a way to integrate that with the PA system as well to potentially trigger, yeah. you know, a, a lockdown or something like that. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I can't think of the whole situation that that would exist in, but I, the ability for it to do that. Is, and somebody is, is pushes intriguing. the button, right? right? And you want all of these things to happen. Exactly right. We can do that, right? right? So like, for instance, we have another uh, on the PA system. So of course you're gonna have your, your speakers, your amplifiers, that'll all be yeah. put into place. Uh, we have a product called Tablet Media that integrates with ACC that will, once it receives those alarms, can put out those voice messages wherever you want to be sent through the PA system. So that's how we integrate with the PA system is through something like tablet media sure. uh, and other things, whatever whatever you want to happen. Yep. Uh, we have uh, IP speakers for uh, if the camera does pick up something in after hours in a parking lot, it, an automatic message can be played over that IP speaker say, you know, it's after hours, please leave. If they don't leave, the analytic keeps picking it up, it can escalate to a different message. Um, then maybe one of you guys receive it, you can get right on there and then talk live over it as well. So we have options around that and connectivity through, through that. So, which I think brings them together. So this is much more than a camera and a recorder, right? It's that workflow. What happens when that incident picks up? Maybe some things that you guys aren't doing now that you wanna do in the future. Just know that there's a big, much, much bigger picture here than just a camera, a recorder, and some card readers. It's Hard really, question. yes. In the event of an emergency and the building has been, this is a scenario, the building's been cleared, right? Is there a way for us to be able to see if there's any movement in that building, like to build a workflow that would activate if a button was pushed or if something happened that uh, people who are sweeping the building, building can verify that there's nobody left? I don't know if that's something Rave would do. Well, we used to have a product called the Vigilant Presence Detector, which basically was micro radar that could do, you know, works on your chest compressions. Yeah. Unfortunately, they no longer they, they no longer make the chips to make that product. Uh, that's fine. But, but I'm just asking yeah. about movement. Like, because if you yeah, so you know, somebody walking through a hallway, like, can you turn on a specific set of features at a on the fly? On the fly. Yeah. Yeah, you could set that up. You could yeah. set that up to be your presence in presence, so people in area or something like that. And you know, won't be. So like if we clear the building and then we can turn on the system and say, Show where are there people? Because yeah. they're not supposed to be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you had your all your corridor cameras in a group, yeah. you could quickly hit those and search for motion, motion yeah. on yeah. If there's any motion on those cameras, it'll, it'll show it to you. Okay. If there's any motion in those areas. So, so Yeah, we'd set up a rule or an alert that you would just not have active or enabled until you need that enabled. Then all you got to do is go into software, quick enable go and it'll enable that and then it'll immediately start that rule or alert will start being active. Okay. Yeah. Well really appreciate being invited back. Uh, I hope you guys see the value in the system and the power behind it and that basically all these different pieces help you frame out the puzzle but it becomes clear when everything is together and working. So I uh, really appreciate the involvement from our team. Uh, as you can see, we're well supported in the Colorado market, and there's probably a really good reason that you're going to get good recommendations from our existing customers. Do you want to take a second to just review the questions, make sure we answered all, all of these? Real quick, I have them. I oh, can sure. list them and just make sure. So first one was uh, live monitoring view. I saw how we were able to do that. Uh, review video for past events, scrubbing and jumping. That's sort of our appearance search. That makes that very quick and easy to do. Um, he didn't show it to you, but you can also do that. You can find where an object was and wasn't, okay? So if a laptop goes missing, you go in when the laptop was there, draw a box around that, show me the results, it's gonna put it into individual clips, and then show you when it wasn't there and when it was there. And you can very quickly, within a minute, determine who and when move that, uh, move that object. Um, blurring faces of select objects. This is coming in ACC8. We don't have that currently. Well, I'm told we have it. You can well, do actually, in right? appearance search, you can blur everybody except for the person of interest. Okay. So, but ACC8 will resolve that issue. Okay. Um, so, follow subjects across multiple cameras. Again, we would do that with our appearance search. 
Okay, so that's, you pick the cameras that you want to search. It could be one, it could be 10, 12, 20, whatever, however many, and we'll search that for you. Uh, license plate recognition, we have it, it's available. Um, it's, there is a separate license for that. Well, let me, let me back up on that a little bit. So, license plate detection for us is really the, the, uh, the resolution of that camera needs to be able to see that license plate. So there's that piece, so when you're going manually looking through video, you can say, oh, there's DVO 376, I can see that plate. The license allows you to, uh, that analytics to automatically happen. So you would put that DVO 376 in your database, and when it comes through that camera, it's gonna notify you and do whatever you want to happen after it's detected. So that's what the license piece does. The camera itself is, you know, we wanna size that and make sure that it's getting the detail that you need for license plates. So it can also contribute to Vigilant, which is our uh, sister company underneath Motorola that communicates the national database. You can do five cameras at one site for free. Okay. Uh, the watermarking, that's that uh, authentication that we do when you export the video. So if it's tampered with, we'll know. Um, save video for investigations and do not delete. That's our bookmarking. So you would bookmark it. You can protect it. You can label it whatever you want. Do not delete. Uh, you can put rights to that. You know, so, uh, so you can limit who, who can edit that or even see it. Um, export video for evidence. Showed how easy that is. You can just right click on the top line, on the timeline, pick your camera, your bookmarks from top, start to finish, and share that with, with whoever, with the player as well. Vape detection we would do through our Halo integration, uh, very seamless. Gunshot detection can be done through that. Also, other uh, integrators, the big one on the market is Shooter Detector. Um, we integrate seamlessly with that. Um, event tracking, uh, tagging door access with video surveillance. That's that unification that we're able to do. So card read, camera that's in sight, we can marry that up, send that to whoever. If, uh, if, it's, you know, if the card read's valid, no, nope, don't have to do anything with it. If it's invalid or even after hours, maybe you wanna match up who, who is there, we can do all of that as well, pretty seamlessly from one GUI. Um, redaction, this is what's coming in ACCA. So you'll be able to afterwards take those people out that are not involved within the incident. What's the, you said it's going to be announced next week. What's the normal kind of lag between announce and actual launch? We would see it before the fall. Okay. Yeah, they're telling us it will be, re ACC 8 will probably be released this summer. So, of course, we'll release it. We'll talk about it, promote it. They usually say pre-order thing. So, yeah, probably towards the end of the year we'd be able to be purchased. Um, but for the RFP, um, we could build on those costs now for what, what that is and you wouldn't. You, you get it when okay. it comes available. Um, alerts, push, notif push notifications to security personnel. We can do that multiple ways, through the either through Orchestrate or just a simple text message from when an analytic is picked up can be sent to somebody. So very easy to do. Uh, network requirements, power, bandwidth. That's where our design tool comes in. That's where we want to work with you on laying out these systems, where you want cameras, how many, what those frames per second was. That's where Jim's role comes into play. And we're here as a free resource to do that for you and with you. All right. Um, you like how I just <laughs> what volunteered I'm your time? <laughs> so, uh, questions Does your system integrate with emergency alert systems? Yes, there are several. The big one we're going to promote is Rave because it's owned by Motorola, but we also have integrations with others. Uh, is there, are there any ones in particular that you guys are looking at? We're really more looking at. The systems that are, you know, kind of PA. Right. Well, you guys use Raptor, based. right? We do right. use Raptor. Raptor is writing their integration to ACM. Right now, they would expect to have a release before the fall. So, um, does your system integrate with visitor management systems? Yes. And we have several that we integrate with. And again, depending on what you look at, it, do you have something now or? Raptor. Raptor is using that yeah. for, okay. Um, what is your best practice for surveillability in the event of a network outage? So we talked about, I'd highly recommend putting SD cards, if that's a concern, in your, in your cameras. Uh, that will, I think that's the, the most defined place to, to save that. There's a problem with SD cameras, uh, SD cards. And the problem is, is that they're being written to all the time. They don't have a long lifespan. And we would have to go up and we have to replace those SD cards every two to three years. Okay. We have to touch every camera. And cameras are normally in places that are not very accessible. 
Mm -hmm. So what happens is is that those cards get forgotten and they're left up. Right. So we need a different solution. But they said it can be configured to only write right. when they don't. It exactly. doesn't have network right. connection. Yeah, yeah so I would we say would have to configure it though. Right. Yeah, I and mean, it's just, a, just when you install the camera and you put yeah. the SD. Card I wouldn't want it other honestly because I don't want to like we do need to lose our footage at a certain point in time and I don't want to say that that footage is gone and actually have a copy of it somewhere like and so really I think it's ideal not to have like a redundant copy somewhere that like is well, offline yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'm just saying that we have issues with, with SD cards because of the replacement of them and a lot of vendors tout that as a backup source and it's really not Yes, it's it's not, it's not, Steve, the there's a quality of the card is failover licensing. So yeah. failover basically takes, if you're, you lose your first server connection, right, it's going to fail over to your secondary server. Uh, and that's often helpful for if you're doing just system backups or system, uh, you know, OS upgrades. Now, if you take one machine down, it's going to go to the next machine and continues to record. Okay. That's basically a, a humongous SD card across your entire network. Yeah. <laughs> And there is a quality of the cards as well, so we have a recommendation on the cards that should be used, but it is a function of, and if you're of that card. I'm so. looking at going local per, per site with a, a, an NVR per site and using centralized management without like, boxes at each, each place. I mean, obviously, that's just going to be the best. Yeah, that's, one of our, that's what we found as being our best practice. Sure, absolutely. It, right, it does add <laughs> some complexity, but it is what it is. All right, uh, centigrade event of a network outage, and what is your calculation for storage needed? The district minimum is of 10 days. Again, our design tool, we put all those cameras in there, our cameras, third-party cameras, and we size that accordingly on what's required. Typically do a 20% headroom, so if you add a camera or two, it's not going to change yet. And then again, these uh, the storage devices could be stacked, so you could have multiple ones, you know, centralized one again. Um, I think that was, I think those were the questions, yeah. and I just want to make sure we answer those satisfactorily for you guys. So I don't really see any no's or obstacles here. Great. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate your time. Yes. Yeah, thank you. thank you. One question I had really quick for the, the mobile aspect, the, I can't remember if you said there was a mobile app. <coughs> there forward. is, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they could be... Print fields can see video or whatnot on their phones specifically. Yes. Um, I'm guessing cloud based, so they don't have to be. They don't have to have their particular device on the network to see the the video or whatnot. That's, correct. That's where that cloud services comes in. Right. Yeah. Um, encryption of data, transmit and two fifty six. What is the encryption? Do you don't I think it's two fifty six. I believe. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure the data was. You know, yeah, that's where it needs to talk to at a station. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so both Apple and Android apps in their Play Store and the Apple Store, free download. Do you need to sign the username and password to that? Right. And then, then they'll have access to whatever you want them to have access to. Okay. So maybe this principal only has access to his cameras or her cameras at that school. Okay. You know. And that's pretty much the OU base that we have through Active Directory anyway. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for lunch. Yeah. Yeah. That won't be for the show. <laughs>